in something that can kill a lively party. Scientists at Japan's Nuclear Regulation Authority say an earthquake fault under a nuclear reactor in central Japan may still be active. <laughs> the conclusion could lead to the reactor's decommissioning, although officials do not rule out additional study if new data are made available. A panel of scientists met Thursday to discuss the status of the fault located directly below the number one reactor at the Shika power plant in Ishikawa Prefecture. A draft assessment released last July indicated the fault may shift in the future. A draft assessment released last July indicated the fault may shift in the future. The judgment was based on research conducted by the plant's operator, Hokuriku Electric Power Company, and other data. However, the panel members were later criticized by another group of scientists for not presenting a full explanation. This led to the latest meeting. On Thursday, panel members reaffirmed that the fault likely shifted approximately 120,000 to 130,000 years ago. They added that additional data is needed to make a more accurate assessment. New regulations adopted after the 2011 Fukushima Daiichi accident do not allow the construction of reactor buildings and other key nuclear plant facilities located above an active earthquake fault. Unbelievable. Attention is now focused on how the plant operator will respond to the latest conclusion and what decision the regulator will make. Oh, I can't stand it. The operator of the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant is expected to soon get approval to start freezing the ground around four reactor buildings. Did somebody write stupid on my forehead and I didn't notice it? <laughs> the measure is aimed at creating a wall of frozen soil to stop groundwater from flowing into the buildings where it could become radioactive. Last month, Tokyo Electric Power Company finished burying about 1,500 cooling pipes underground. On Thursday, the Nuclear Regulation Authority basically gave the green light to begin the freezing process. The regulator had raised concerns that if the wall caused the groundwater level to drop too far, it might allow highly contaminated water to leak out. In response, TEPCO proposed doing the freezing work in stages, starting on the side facing the sea. Then the uphill side would be frozen. If the groundwater level falls too much, the operator would stop pumping out water from nearby wells. The regulator will give final approval this month if it receives a concrete emergency response plan from the operator and finds no problems. TEPCO initially planned to have the project completed by the end of March, but it is estimated to take another eight months to completely freeze the wall. Decommissioning work is underway at three nuclear power plants in Japan. But there's a problem. There is no set plan for storing low-level waste. The mayor of Tokai Village says his community intends to be the first to allow such storage. NHK World's Daisuke Kamikubo has this exclusive report. I don't want to see the demolition work suspended. Tokai Village Mayor Osamu Yamada has thought long and hard about the Tokai power station. On the one hand, he wants to see its demolition completed. On the other, there is a question of what to do with its nuclear waste. The Tokai power station began operating in 1966. It was Japan's first commercial nuclear plant. Operations ended in 1998. And three years later, it became Japan's first commercial nuclear reactor to be decommissioned. The challenge? Figuring out how to dispose of its radioactive waste. For high-level waste, the central government takes care of it. But when it comes to low-level waste, the government has asked power utilities to deal with it themselves. There are three categories of low-level nuclear waste. L1, the highest, includes parts inside the reactor. 
L2 includes the reactor's containment vessel, and L3, the lowest, includes concrete and other structural debris from demolished buildings. The Japan Atomic Power Company operated the Tokai plant. Its plan is to permanently bury L3 waste at the plant site. First, though, it needs local government approval. Now that the waste is limited to L3, I feel there's no alternative but to approve the plan. If this plan is finalized, Tokai Village will become the first municipality in the country to approve radioactive waste disposal. As for other low-level waste at the plant, there is still no consensus on what to do with it. Assistant Professor Kota Juraku at Tokyo Denki University sits on the National Council for Radioactive Waste. The question is, should the waste be disposed of on-site or off-site? Or should it be moved to other areas? These discussions ought to be led by the national government and seek a consensus. Other facilities being decommissioned have no plan at all for their radioactive waste. Meanwhile, there is no word from any level of government on how to deal with this challenge. Daisuke Kamikubo, NHK World. Representatives from municipalities near the Fukushima plant are calling on the government to widen the scope of its cleanup. They say it should extend the sweep for radioactive matter to remote forest areas. Assembly members from eight municipalities visited Tokyo to share their concerns with the state minister for the environment. A representative of Futaba town said many evacuees still have concerns about going back. Duh. The state minister said the government is ready to clean up parts of forests that are widely accessed by people. And he suggested Tokyo will create a task force to look at ways to regenerate more secluded locations. Central government officials have limited the cleanup of radioactive substances to within 20 meters of communities. They've made an exception for campsites and other spots that regularly draw visitors. You're a volcano expert and you're talking to the skeptical mayor, Greg. Uh, you're on the lip of a dormant volcano after it's beginning to show signs of life. Uh, she's going to blow. A volcano has erupted in southern Japan in dramatic fashion, causing a lockdown of the local area. The Sakurajima volcano erupted at 7 p.m. local time. Authorities have issued a level three warning, banning entry as lava flowed down the mountain. So far, there have been no injuries reported. Well, the very active volcano is located on one of Japan's smaller southern islands, just 50 kilometers away from the Sendai nuclear power plant. But no immediate warnings have been issued. The plant was the first to restart operations after a shutdown of all nuclear reactors in Japan following, of course, the Fukushima nuclear disaster in 2011. That tragedy almost five years ago now started with a magnitude 9 earthquake which in turn triggered a tsunami with waves up to 40 meters high. The natural disaster killed almost 16,000 people and partly destroyed the nuclear power plant there. It caused several reactors to melt down, reaching radioactive, excuse me, danger levels not seen since the Chernobyl disaster. Well, let's cross live now to Professor Christopher Busby, the Scientific Secretary of the European Commission on Radioaction uh, Risks. You're very welcome to the programme. Just first of all, how dangerous is the situation in Kagoshima at the moment? We're talking, of course, because it's so close to the Sendai nuclear plant, 50 kilometres away. Well, from what I've seen, I don't think that the um, volcano will have any, any, any impact on the Sendai plant. It's it's, it's actually, I mean, 50 kilometers in terms of, of the sort of uh, volcanic eruption is, is really quite a long way. So I can't see that there's going to be any. And indeed, there's some there's a, a length of water between the volcano and the mainland on the opposite side of which is, is the Sendai plant. So, so first of all, I don't think there's going to be any effect unless there's a, a f f further seismic activity which, which affects the plant itself. But of course, this is, this is quite separate from the volcanic eruption. 
the Sakurajima volcano, it is very active. There were several large eruptions last year. It's located there in the Ring of Fire. How prepared is that region for a major disaster which could occur? Well, I would hope that it was, uh, given all these things, and given that, of course, Japan is, 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 a, is a very volcanic um, region, uh, and you would think that they would be prepared. Uh, but then, of course, you would think that they would have been prepared for the Fukushima um, mm. disaster also. And it turns out that that overwhelmed whatever preparations they had in place. Um, so, that, I mean, uh, uh, that, that's really all I could say about it. I, I would hope that they were adequately prepared. Well, how safe was it, do you believe, to relaunch the, uh, the reactors there? The one in this region was, was the first two years um, after the shutdown following Fukushima. Well, I said all along following the Fukushima disaster uh, um, that, that uh, none of those nuclear plants should have been restarted. Uh, we, we see again and again um, in terms of these plant startups that, that the authorities say that the probability of some serious damage occurring as a result of volcanic activity is, almost, is vanishingly small. You, we hear words like one in 10,000 years risk. But actually, we have seen that, that the Fukushima uh, disaster has, has, has shown that, 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 that um, there is a significant risk. And the risk is a very low, even if it's a very low probability one, the impact is so appallingly big that it really, I don't think that, it, that any of those nuclear plants should have been, should have been started. Have you seen much change in terms of safety measures or laws indeed for nuclear operations since the disaster? They don't seem to have taken any notice of it. Or, or it seems to be business as usual. I, I mean, that, that, that there have been no, as far as I can see, no real changes made that would ena enable, uh, that would prevent another Fukushima disaster occurring. Um, and, and in fact, it's really quite difficult to imagine what they could do, because, because a nuclear plant is, is extremely susceptible to that kind of thing. If anything goes wrong on that sort of level and you get breakages in the cooling system, then you get meltdowns, as we saw at Fukushima. So there's not really much they can do. You can't make a safe nuclear plant. That's the, that's the short answer. Professor Chris Busby, Scientific Secretary of the European Committee on Radiation Risks, thank you for coming on the programme this hour. The Japan Meteorological Agency says Mount Sakurajima in western Japan has erupted. The agency is calling on people who live in the surrounding area to be on the alert. Local police say there are no reports of damage or injuries at this point. Agency officials say eruptions around the Showa crater happened just before 7 p.m. local time. A nearby observatory says smoke is rising over two kilometers into the sky. The officials have also raised the eruption alert level, which means people should stay clear of the volcano. We raised the alert level to three because large volcanic rocks were thrown 1,300 to 1,800 meters away from the crater. The volcanic eruption could intensify further. The officials are warning people within two kilometers to watch out for large falling rocks and volcanic ash streams. In August, earthquakes below the volcano led to a partial evacuation advisory, and Mount Sakurajima's last major eruption was in mid-September. Between January and September of last year, it erupted more than 700 times. Good day, this is Dr. Conrad Miller with your Fukushima update for February 2nd. 2016. It has been a while since I've given you an update, but let me tell you what's going on now. Since the accident on March 11, 2011, when we had the multiple explosions of the multiple units at Fukushima in northeast Japan, radioactive water has been running out of the plant at the rate of 400 tons per day. TEPCO, the Tokyo Electric Power Company that runs the plant, built a wall, a sea wall, 100 feet deep into the bedrock to try to stem the flow of this radioactive water. They claim that it has to the rate now of 300 tons of radioactive water per day. However, measurements of the fish and in the seawater outside the plant are still the same. And the wall is starting to lean 20 centimeters towards the ocean already since October. The measurements of the fish in the Fukushima area of the Pacific are still the same. 
a thousand becquerels per kilogram and that is way too high for consumption at least in Japan where they only allow a hundred becquerels of cesium per kilogram of course there are all the other elements that uh, we have to worry about being in fish and food and so on in the ocean and on the land in the United States we allow 1200 becquerels per kilogram of cesium in our food Germany recommends only five becquerels per kilogram of cesium in any food because this adds up to bioaccumulate after a while and bioconcentrate in our bodies so after three years of ingesting radioactive cesium we might be at the point where we're about 1500 becquerels in our body because the half-life of cesium is 30 years the hazardous life is 10 to 20 half-lives or 300 to 600 years so it bioaccumulates in our bodies especially in the kids and women and, and children are more susceptible to the cancers and this can also affect the heart this has been called Chernobyl heart in the studies that have been done where once you have a 30 kilogram kid for example and they have 1500 becquerels of cesium in their body that means they have 50 becquerels per kilogram of cesium in their body and that will cause damage to the heart and also to the kidneys and the bladder so we don't want that to happen to our people but in Japan they want them to move back in because they want to cut off the subsidies to the people that have evacuated due to the accident they're opening a town making it look like everything's wonderful then they can cut off the subsidies to people that have relocated which will happen apparently in March of 2017 they still have the secrets laws in effect in Japan where you can't be a journalist and report any critical news about Fukushima so that stems the information of what's really coming out and now they're sending groups out to America and other countries saying it's just a rumor that everything's wrong over here as if nothing's going on meanwhile we have the Olympics coming up there too so that's basically the story in a nutshell uh, one other thing is that in the Fukushima area the exposure to radiation is about 2,000 millirems per year which over a lifetime will cause one in six people to have cancer when it's supposed to be only with nuclear power they say oh one to ten thousand or one to a million people get cancer but now they're saying one to six is okay so this is not good and these people shouldn't have to move back in the normal background radiation exposure is really about a hundred millirems per year at sea level two hundred year two hundred millirems up in the mountains of Colorado for example so that's the basic story and um, be aware that this leakage could go on forever. They don't know how to stop it. And sooner or later, this is going to bioaccumulate up the whole chain uh, in our lot, plant life and sea life and get onto the land. We're consuming that food, and it will add up in our bodies, and it will add up in the environment and in the Pacific Ocean as time goes along, unless they can figure out a way to really stop the leakage. But the plant still is too hot to get inside these units where some of the exposure is at one little spot in a room in the middle of unit two is 940 rems exposure per hour which will kill you within a few days at least so it's still too hot still too many hot spots inside the plant and the water still leaking out that is your Fukushima update February 2nd 2016, Dr. Conrad Miller. I want to talk to Anthony Gucciardi about another issue, another part of our decaying infrastructure. And of course, that is the risk that's being presented by these aging nuclear power plants. Many of these power plants, Anthony, were put into service. They had uh, anticipated useful lives of uh, 25, 30 years. And what we're seeing happening, I saw this happen in North Carolina, as they get to the 25-year lifespan that they had set these things up and approved them for and licensed them for, 
uh, they just come back in and say, well, you know what, we need the electricity, so let's just extend the, uh, the licensing here. We'll extend it for another 25 years. And what we're seeing is in North Carolina, the one that I'm familiar with that was uh, not too far from where we lived, uh, they were constantly having minor uh, issues. They have a, a pipe burst here or another malfunction over here. They tell us that there wasn't much radiation release, but you don't really have a way to measure that because you can't see it, you can't taste it, you can't smell it. Uh, so unless you've got a Geiger counter, you just got to take their word for it. But there's other issues that we see developing, and one of them is developing in New York. Tell us about that. Yeah, so obviously we have a larger issue. <clears throat> it's beyond just North Carolina and New York. Up to 75% or more of U.S. nuke sites have been found to be leaking, and we'll get into that in a minute. But this reminds us because this is the headline just out a couple days ago. We've got some new information on this as well. 65,000% radioactivity spike. In, in New York right now, 20 miles about above New York City. The New York governor has ordered a probe into the water leak at Indian Point. But we've got some more information on this. So, look, Flint is terrible. What's going on in Flint is absolutely horrible. It's, it's, it's really sad. But what we fail to understand is when we follow the media spotlight, think about it like a very finely pointed spotlight that only highlights one little thing. And there's the rest is kind of darkness, right? The media spotlight goes onto something and we cling onto it and we freak out about it. We have all this hype about it. And, and citizens watch the TV and they say, oh my God, Flint, how horrible. But unfortunately, the spotlight prevents us from looking around in the shadows about what else is going on. And these stories from 2011 as far back warning us over and over again, such as radioactive leaks found at 75% of U.S. nuke sites. Well, well, just going back to that Flint thing and, of course, the spotlight that they put on it, that's a situation where you can see it. You can smell it, you can taste it, you can take video of it, and it has immediate effects on these children in many cases. The issue, though, with the nuclear stuff is it's so much more dangerous simply because it's so difficult to detect and because of the, the effects of it can take a while to manifest themselves, and they can manifest themselves in a way that you can't precisely pin it on that. They can always say, well, it was something else in the environment that gave all these kids cancer. They also can't make it a politically correct slash race slash yeah, offensive issue, yeah. right? The nuclear like power plants, issue. they can't say that it's specifically targeting a certain percentage of people or a certain kind of people or whatever. It's also not sensational because as of right now, it will be sensational when these nuke sites really start leaking. Hopefully it doesn't happen. But if they do, if we don't do something about it, and little kids really start getting deformed and, and bad things happen, then it will be sensational. But I like to fix things before it turns super sensational, right? Yeah. That's my angle. Let's, let's do something before it turns into a mega catastrophe. <laughs> and for me, radiation is one of the scariest things because Flint, yes, you have lead in the water. And again, it is very sad and it is horrible, but you can actually do something about it. You can change out the pipes, right? Mm -hmm. You can fix what's going on. You can have mega filtration systems going on. If you have radiation leaks into the water supply, you can't exactly do that, right? It's much yeah. more challenging. And think about, think about Flint in comparison to what we're about to read. This is from 2011. This ties into what's going on now. Radioactive leaks found at 75% of U.S. nuke sites. This is from CBS News. Radioactive tritium, or tr tritium. Oh, tritium has leaked from three quarters of U.S. commercial nuclear power sites, often into groundwater from corroded, buried piping, as Associated Press investigation shows. I also mentioned this is the same type of hydrogen isotope, radioactive hydrogen isotope that's been leaking from New York. The number and severity of the leaks has been escalating, even as federal regulators extend the licenses of more than more reactors across the nation. So they're just saying, oh, you're fine. You're mm -hmm. leaking, no big deal. You've got these old, aging, creaky facilities, okay, we're just yes. extended arbitrarily. Over and over again. Okay, and that's one aspect. The other aspect of it, of course, is having to store the nuclear waste. In most cases, they will store that nuclear waste on site. And that was a big part of the Fukushima issue was uh, waste that was stored on site. So you have two different issues. You have a, uh, a gradual, not, not, you know, people typically think about something like uh, Chernobyl or Three Mile Island where there's a catastrophic meltdown or something, okay? This is the gradual deterioration of these plants and they do nothing about it. And then the storage of this waste, which has to be done for thousands of years. I mean, if you look at this from a cost benefit analysis, how could you possibly justify nuclear power in the sense that you've got to store this waste for thousands of years without any leaking into the environment. I mean, you know, what, how do you put a price tag on that when you calculate the cost of energy from nuclear power? Right. And for me, it's, it's, it's beyond just the debate of whether or not we should even have it. It's, hey, look, it's here. 
<laughs> and we're going to extend these licenses and just going to let these people dump into the groundwater. It's no big deal. Everything's fine. Right. Yeah. So, so to me, it's, even, it's just so absurd. So the tritium, which is a radioactive form of hydrogen, as I just mentioned, has leaked from at least 48 of the 65 sites, according to the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission records reviewed as part of the AP's year-long examination. Great job for the AP to actually do this, by the way, of safety issues at aging nuclear power plants. Leaks from at least 37 of those facilities contained concentrations exceeding the federal drinking water standard, sometimes at hundreds of times the limit. While most leaks have been found within plant boundaries, some have migrated off-site. Oh, but none is known to have reached public water supplies. Now, yeah, not, tritium, not known. <laughs> right. So this is from 2011, right? Yeah. The nuke site's leaking. And says, well, it's not a big deal. You know, it is, it is pretty bad. But then, again, this is a warning from 2011. Then, this month in 2016, 65,000% radioactive spike. New York governor orders probe into Water Lake in Indian Point. It's the tritium, the same kind of radioactive isotope of hydrogen. And this plant had been shut down in 1974 because it had some issues. Now, we see the same thing happening. We were warned in 2011, and they knew about it long before that. Of the three wells in question, according to Cuomo's statement, radioactive, radioactivity increased nearly 65,000%, while in total the company reported alarming levels of radioactivity. The cause of contamination is unknown. So these are plants that have been shut down. So this is the story. No, no, no. This is a new plant. Uh -huh. The Indian Point plant previously had been a plant at that same site had been shut down in 1974 because of cooling issues i see so they just like oh whatever we'll, we'll fix it and they opened up a new one and now it's leaking into the groundwater and they're saying they don't know what's going on they don't know how and they're acting like it's a new phenomenon but this it we know it's been happening you know around around the united states and 75 percent of plants what i find amazing too when we look at this is is, is that what are they so upset about? I mean, they're upset about carbon dioxide. They're not upset about nuclear waste that's moving into our water supply. They're, what they're totally freaking, trying to freak everybody out about is carbon dioxide, which is necessary for plants. You know, it makes plants grow. It's something that's a natural thing that comes out. That's what they're so totally focused on. We had one moment of sanity uh, yesterday. We had a 5-4 decision with the Supreme Court saying they're going to put a... Uh, uh, a halt on the implementation of Obama's uh, regulations, his executive order implemented through the EPA to essentially shut down and control all electricity generation with coal. He said he was going to bankrupt the, uh, the coal industry. He hasn't been able to do that yet. They've put a stay on this order, and it's not going to, uh, nothing's going to change with it until after the presidential election. So the next president, whoever we choose, is going to deal with this. Either going to try to revive that, uh, you know, uh, Bernie Sanders says he thinks that, uh, uh, climate uh, is is the biggest threat to us of anything. Okay, so we know where he's going to go with this. So if we get somebody who's a Republican, they'll probably will shut that down. But it's amazing to me that they make that the big issue and they totally ignore what's going on with uh, with, with nuclear uh, contamination, with radiation, with these aging, leaking facilities. And many of these people who are part of this environmental uh, movement will say, no, no, we need to have uh, nuclear because it doesn't have any carbon dioxide. Yeah, exactly. And then they act like this is nothing and not a big deal. And under Obama, new plants are being made. It's just, as we mentioned, the regulations are just licenses are going over and over and over again. It's absolutely twilight zone, as we hear. When the fish all die and the lakes catch fire, will it be worth it then? And when the cancer it's 90% or high, will it be worth it then? When the whole world's at war over water and oil, will it be worth it then? And when there's no more fighting, cause there's no more spoils, will it be worth it
Will it be worth 